Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jenny Hornick, and I'm the Digital Marketing Coordinator here at JMIR Publications. I'm very excited to welcome you to another webinar in collaboration with the Society of Digital Psychiatry and JMIR Mental Health. So as you all know, today's webinar topic is empowering global mental wellness, harnessing e-mental health collaborations for positive impact. So I will pass things over to the panel shortly, but before I do that, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. First off, all of your microphones are going to be muted for this webinar, but we do encourage that you ask our panelists questions as they come up. So feel free to do that just by dropping those into the Q&A box. And then towards the end of the webinar, we will have a designated time for the panelists to answer those questions. Uh, secondly, we are recording this event and we will be posting the recording to our YouTube channel and we'll also be sending it uh, via email afterwards as well. Finally, some exciting news uh, for this webinar series is that we're actually looking for guests for future webinars. So if you enjoy this series and you feel as though you might make an interesting guest on a future webinar, or perhaps you have a colleague that you think could be a good panelist, stay tuned for that follow-up email that I just mentioned, because we will also be providing a link um, to an application form that you can complete to uh, become our next guest. So we will then review all those submissions and then contact you if we believe that you know your expertise aligns with the goals of the webinar series. So that's all I have for you uh, today, but I'm going to go ahead and pass things off to Dr. John Torres. So Dr. Torres is the director of the Digital Psychiatry Division in the Department of Psychiatry at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center which is an affiliated teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. He's also the editor-in-chief of J.M. Meyer Mental Health. And so now I will go ahead and pass things over to John to kick things off. Excellent. Thank you all for joining. And those of you watching asynchronously, welcome as well. I'm very excited that today we have Neil Thapliel with us. He's the executive director and e-mental health lead of the e-mental health international collaborative. He's also faculty of health and environmental sciences at Auckland University. And he does a lot of work that we're going to hear about in areas of strategy, policy, and implementation for really making e-mental health solutions scalable. He's worked on the National Depression Initiative in New Zealand and so much else. He's also organizing, we'll talk about it, the Digital Mental Health International Congress for 2024. And the theme is going to be building digital capacity 24 seven, so it never stops, mental health support for all, which will be September 19th through 20th in Ottawa in Canada. So Neil, thank you so much for joining us. And to start out for those listening, what is the eMental Health International Collaborative for those who may not have heard of it yet? Thank you for this welcome, John. I'm pleased to be here and greetings to all all the listeners. Uh, I'm darling right now from a place called Queenstown, South Island of New Zealand. So it's 8 a.m. on Thursday morning here. So greetings. So what is eMental Health International Collaborative? It's uh, It's been a journey 26 years in making. And uh, part of that uh, journey has been looking at what's working on the ground at scale and sustainable ways in various countries. The tendency is for us to work in silos and uh, develop initiatives. And when you do a audit or stock take of a variety of initiatives that are happening, um, and I was part of an audit in uh, Australia of all the email health initiatives, the findings were there was so much of duplication, there was so much of uh, you know uh, replication. So, so rather than uh, duplicate and uh, you know in the, invest money in the areas where somebody's already working and doing great work. So how do we collaborate across the borders? So, so the whole uh, 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 the whole reason why e mental health international collaborative, uh, we call it EMIC for short, so it's easier to say EMIC. So EMIC's existence is to how do we across work across borders? U.S. government is one of the founding nations. Then we have Canada, Sweden, uh, England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, Australian government, New Zealand. Singapore, Philippines, and uh, most recent one is Denmark. So we got many countries 
uh, at a country leadership level interested in knowing what's working. So we've got some amazing initiatives like uh, Center for Digital Psychiatry in uh, Denmark, which has been funded uh, by the health authorities for the past 11 years. So if you want to do something along those lines in New Zealand or in Australia and Canada, do we need to reinvent the wheel or do we collaborate with the um, Denmark health authorities to uh, how do we bring it across? So so it's more about collaboration and, uh, and what does a good collaboration look like? And um, so how do we connect? How do we collaborate? How do we inspire? And how do we make a difference? So that's in a broad sense what EMIC is all about. That's very broad, even geographically. I was thinking in my head, that's a lot of places you may have to visit as as the director seeing them all. And in in also seeing a lot of papers in JMIR, I've always wanted to write a paper called Duplication in the Digital Age. I think it's a, it's a catchy title, but really gets to what you talked about. The theme is everyone wants to use technology to improve mental health. But so many times we see kind of the same things over and over. And sadly, we see sometimes the same challenges come up and teams aren't aware of them, and they have the same barriers to overcome versus instead of that collaboration and synergy. So it it definitely makes a lot of sense. I think that's why we're so excited to have people, especially here, learning from you and learning what we'll call it EMIC, because it's easier for me as well, learning from EMIC and what you do. And with this vantage point you have, Neil, of looking across the government sector, different innovative research, what different countries are doing, people on the ground. What makes you most excited that you're seeing, that, that you're going, this is going to be really important, this is growing? And I, I know it's a broad question, but let, let's see where it goes. Yeah, great. No, thank you for asking. Uh, I'll probably take the liberty of just uh, uh, going, uh, giving you a more of a macro overview of uh, EMIC's uh, remit. So when yeah. we talk about EMIC and what it does, uh, we have uh, predicated our existence on not on looking at developing new solutions or going down the path of uh, research and development. We would rather collaborate with Howard and UCLA and Oxford and other premier institutions around the world because they that's their core expertise. Our core expertise is around implementation, what's working on the ground. So what are the core principles that, um, that underpin what EMIC does? So... The first and foremost, the first pillar, which I call is the central pillar, is if it does not work for the person with the lived experience, their families and the carers, then it does not work at all. Let's stop talking about the fancy, shiny toy. It needs to work. It needs to be as simple as that. So what does a good, authentic co-design looks like? And, and we can't be tokenistic about it. Uh, so I've always, first and foremost, in all years of uh, my life and my professional commitment to EMIC has been putting myself in the shoes of the person with the lived experience. So if we don't start with that as a starting point, I think we will bound to make some mistakes which are not going to resonate with the people who are going to use it. So that's number one. Number two is looking at who says it works. Where is the evidence? Where is the data? So I think uh, there is a second part is uh, not to be underestimated and not to be pushed under the carpet because we are good Samaritan. And one of our family members was affected and we got some good family inheritance, which we can invest in doing something good for the largest society. But I think we need to be careful. We are, the word of caution is, do we know it works? And uh, is it making the difference? So where is that data and the evidence? So that's number two. Number three is, um, I have a privilege of working with so many countries around the world. And John, to your point earlier on, uh, yes, there is only so many uh, Zoom meetings you can have and Teams meeting you can have. And there is a time and place when people want to meet you in person and uh, do on-ground work, whether with digital mental health roundtables in those countries, think tanks, or a variety of other events which we do locally. So so uh, when we're looking at what, what I have learned is... Um, there is a desire to develop some digital mental health uh, standards or digital mental health uh, policy, digital mental health frameworks. And every country, no two countries are doing the same thing. So um, so our government of Ireland just said develop a digital mental health uh, national roadmap. Um, so, so they're going to be presenting that at this year's Congress. Uh, and, uh, Australia has developed digital mental health standards, which they're right in the middle of uh, implementing right now. New Zealand has an uh, email framework. So uh, so rather than uh, every country doing their own thing, and if we think of e-mental health as an ecosystem, 
and every country is doing a different part of the jigsaw puzzle. Isn't, wouldn't it be beautiful if you are able to complete the jigsaw puzzle by collaborating with each other? Because it's so much more powerful when we can come together. So what? So policy and strategy is the third strand of EMIC and what EMIC uh, is all about. So we work very closely with the government of those nations uh, and including the United States. So we have a, a, a policy and a strategy remit. Then the fourth one is, you know, we call it clinician engagement or call it workforce development. Unless people have bought into it, if that it works, how does it benefit the people who are going to use it? Uh, how does it fit into the care pathways? Is it integrated into the EMR or uh, patient management system I'm using? There are a range of questions. P, I have not met a single clinician, mental health person uh, working in the mental health area who does not want to prescribe non-medicated uh, non treatment options. They do not know where to find them. They do not know how it benefits the patients. So the key thing is making it easier for people to navigate through and so that they can confidently and safely prescribe or coach and guide the person in front of them. So workforce, well, I like to call it a broad sense of workforce development, or some people like to refer to it as clinician engagement. We have to get the right, we have to invest in it, not just in the tools, but in that area as well. And the fifth one is looking at the role of industry. In many uh, 26 years of my life uh, commitment to this domain development is often I've seen sometimes uh, commercial uh, fields, uh, vendors are seen as somebody out there with vested interest. But majority of the initiatives which are highly scalable, I work with Saatchi and Saatchi, I work with Dart FCB, I work with Amazon Web Services, I work with Google Health. So I think we have to see them, they are part of the ecosystem. So we have the, they bring a different assets, different kind of infrastructure, different capabilities, which we cannot, uh, there's no point in reinventing. So I always say that the only way we can create symphony is when we let each maestro play their own instrument. And but what does a good authentic value-based collaboration looks like? So that's where I'll just stop and probably uh, expand on it as we move forward. Yeah. So to summarize, it's again, these there's lived experience that has to work for people, it actually has to work as well clinically. And you said, who says it works matters. There have to be standards around these, and those are going to be different people who develop them, but the workforce has to use it and an industry has to be able to build and support it. So that's, that's a lot of pieces coming together, but I can imagine almost thinking of every single project that we kind of get submitted as a paper to JMIR Mental Health or kind of when different people in the Society of Digital Psychiatry come to us, often multiple ones of these are the issues at hand, right? It's not just one of them. It's I built a thing and how do I make sure it fits regulation? It works for people. It'll be maintained. So I imagine that keeps you busy then trying to keep all those five horses aligned for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, it's not easy, John. It's um, I must say that I didn't get into it to make money. I didn't get into it to become famous. You, we need to have a calling. We need we are we are in mental health field for a reason, and some of us are vested in it for the very long haul. Uh, and I think uh, some of us have, I take this privilege of working with these so many governments around the world very seriously, seriously because. Uh, we are making the difference in this world because the scale of uh, some of these initiatives, and you talked about earlier on about what's working, what gets me excited. So yeah. when I look at, I also get to see in all these nations, the pockets of brilliance, so where, which province in say in Canada, which state in the United States, which region in Sweden, which part of Australia is light years ahead of the rest of the nation that they are in. So, so I also get to see the pockets of brilliance. And I can just tell you, uh, it's got nothing to do with money, John. It's got to do with somebody inspiring leader. Leadership is number one, bold leadership, ability to take risk and having a strong vision. And somehow the right money, the right assets appear for those people because it's, it's all about leadership. I yeah, know it's in the US, we had some pretty notable bankruptcies last year and a B billion dollar kind of digital health companies that disappeared. But I guess on that, I, I think you and I are both positive about digital health, but it's always important to ask. And I think, Neil, the reason you've had such success is you, you're balanced. So I think you probably can tell us all what worries you the most or kind of what do you wish 
people would listen to you more and in, in, in improve on in this space? I think uh, I always say, let's get it right by design. You know, you can get it right by uh, default or get it right by design. Uh, when people think of design, they're thinking within the context of their own silos. They are working within the silo of wherever they're working. Um, I always think, let's, uh, I have an overview of uh, uh, the whole macrocosm of what works. So, so my thinking is um, uh, collaboration, uh, 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 where um, uh, digital mental health is not one thing. We need to, uh, it's not so much just about the digital. A digital has, happens to be the word in front of it. Uh, but I think it's still about people, it's still about trust. The, the, that is fundamental. Uh, trust in uh, people, it needs to be seen as, a, in some cases, could be a complementary adjunct. It's not a, a thing on its own. It could be a thing on its own. It could be part of the blended care or standalone, as I said earlier. So I think what we need to look at is, uh, it's the, the word digital sometimes can polarize people's thinking as to as to what it is and all. So we don't need uh, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists anymore. We don't need clinics anymore. Uh, I think that's going down the wrong path. I think we, we need to look at it. It's not either or. It's one plus one equals 11, not two. So what does 11 looks like and what does, how do we make that 11 happen? And um, so, yes. Yeah. No, I, I've never seen anyone lose their job to a chatbot, to AI, or, or to an app. And if you look at the engagement data for these self-help apps, it's very low. I think there, there's a famous paper that was published, and I think it showed engagement was about 5% after 10 days for the average person. Some people, of course, can use it, but the self-help tools are, are not probably the future of this field. But thinking about the future, you, you're always busy, but I imagine you're especially busy because in September, I think the 19th and 20th Ottawa, you're organizing the Digital Mental Health International Congress coming up. How did you tell us about what's going to, what, what is going to be there? You picked the theme of 24 seven in digital mental health, but maybe for people who haven't been to the Congress before, want to know how it's organized. What is the, the view from the man who is behind it all? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, look, uh, it's very uh, interesting uh, the way you asked me subtle, but uh, very, um, um, pointed uh, questions, which is uh, exciting. So look, thank you. So I just want to uh, also say one thing, um, how communication has shifted over the last uh, two decades alone in front of our eyes ever since uh, Facebook was launched in 2005. So, you know, so there was a British uh, research which talks about how we are using these devices these days. You know, the, all of us carry a phone and um, how we are using these devices. And for the first time, making a phone call from your phone has, has not made it to the top 10 activities we buy it for. So number one is texting. And, and the list goes on. I can share all of that um, via chat. But so number 11 is the making phone call from your phone. So that's what we buy it for. So, so it's not about digital. It's more about speaking the consumer's language. So that's where the consumer is. Let's not miss that opportunity. That's how uh, there is a beautiful piece of uh, research that's come out of Hope Lab out of San Francisco. Amy Green, uh, some of you would know her. She talks about most conversations surrounding social media and youth mental health largely focus on the harms, portraying young people as passive consumers. The research shows it is much more complex if we truly want to improve the well-being of young people. We need to listen to their experiences and ensure that we do not inadvertently remove access to crucial positive benefits. So we need to be a little bit more balanced about how uh, what it's all about. So when we reached out to all the member countries around the world of EMIC, we asked all the uh, administrators of healthcare, administrators of health, what uh, uh, and director generals of health. What is the single biggest pain point in mental health in your country? You know, initially it came as a surprise, huge surprise. The, the pain point across all nations around the world was same. It was recruitment and retention. 
the biggest pain point was recruitment and retention in mental health care was the number one biggest pain point in all the regions around the world. So, so we uh, we huddled together with those countries, and that's how the theme of digital building capacity came. So, digital building is no more a fringe thing. We the the way uh, the level of development and scale of uh, maturity of the sector is so that it's no more a fringe conversation which is out there on the side as an innovation project. Yeah. King. Yep. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, so that's how the the theme of digital building capacity came. Uh, uh, right around the world, I was very moved by a um, a, a young person with the lived experience who had uh, made several, several you know uh, attempts on her life, and she was speaking and very young, very bright, uh, and and she she talked about how many times she made the attempts and how she got into ED and got sent back home. But last time when she was, uh, she was determined to finish it once and for all. Uh, it was 3 a.m. on Saturday morning that she reached out to a online uh, e-mental health uh, service in her country and, uh, and, uh, and how it saved her life. And uh, she gave the credit. Now she's doing a master's and, uh, and you know, quite good to see and um, um, I keep very close contact with her because those are the people, inspirations that make the world, uh, world of work you are on mine, John, worth it. So, so for me, listening to that, there was not even a single person in the room who did not have a tear in their eyes that they, the ministers of health and everyone, there was no word to be. So what she was saying, you call it digital mental health, I call it mental health. Because th that's the only way I know how to access services and there is no way in this world, she would have thought of accessing the traditional mental health services did not even cross her mind. So the one of the things is how do we provide what we call is digital mental health or e-mental health? Or I would rather drop it in uh, time to come and call it just mental health. How do we make these solutions available to the people at the time and place of their choosing? So whether it's 3 a.m. in the morning for um, uh, the one I'm talking about uh, example. So what does a 24-7 mental health support for all looks like? Yeah. And that does require building a new workforce, as you said, because I think all of us listening and audience too have probably imagined there's some clinicians that have been very resistant to this. There's some that have embraced it, but it probably is because they don't have the education and training and it's very in very few medical schools and residencies that actually offer training in how to use these new tools, how to evaluate apps, how to kind of think about using large language models, because there's definitely benefits and risks for it. So that, that'll be a very relevant and timely theme for the meeting. And I imagine then people from all the member nations will, will come. So it'll be a rather diverse gathering too. Yes, uh, all the member nations are going to be there in person, both at a government level. So government leadership from all those nations is there in person on the ground. So we have a range of um, amazing, uh, you know, celebration of what's working on the ground. And we have a session called brag and steal. So that means each country can brag on about what they're doing and other countries can steal the idea. So brag and steal is a very simple notion. It's one of the most popular initiative of AMIC brag and steal. And uh, I, so somebody introduced me to this notion, uh, John, duck hunting has got nothing to do with ducks. And it's more to do with social connectedness and a sense of community of those hunters who get their care. Their aid. So um, it got me thinking, I said, well, digital mental health has got nothing to do with digital. It is more to do with people, the trust, the right mental health support services at the time and place one, one needs it. So it's kind of a challenges me, but also I'm connected to the, as I said, the people with the lived experience first and foremost, that's my starting point, emix starting point. And you cannot go wrong if that's where you're starting from. You know, it, it, someone once told me a funny joke that anytime you put a battery in something now, it's digital health, right? So it does get to the point. It, it, it's about people. It's You can't just say, I put a battery in anything and it's now, it's digital health. It really is about, as you said, getting clinicians and and patients to use it together, having a regulatory system, having products that work and industry that can build them. And that's that's an ecosystem that's certainly not fully functional everywhere. Hopefully it will be. And I think we're seeing improvements there. But I think 
maybe for the last question is a lot of the people in our society are junior, they're learning about the field, they want to get involved, they have exciting ideas, but it's a little bit intimidating. And, and you, know, you get you have the insider view, but how, how do people take those first steps of kind of moving their early ideas or their passion on the right direction? Because there's so much to do in the space and you, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, no, I think... Uh... Uh, before, you know, for the big part of those 26 years I was talking about, it used to be a conversation that centered more around the developed nations. Uh, in the last uh, five, six years, it's uh, pivoted. Now we've got Philippines on board, we've got uh, uh, Bangladesh on board. So uh, a psychiatrist from Bangladesh um, uh, called me, and Dr. Tashtik Hassan, he called me and he said, um, uh, we got uh, two, uh, you know, 170 million people. 293 psychiatrists uh, and 90% and of them live in one city called Dhaka, the capital, and the rest of the country uh, has got very meager resources. Even if you double, triple, quadruple the workforce, it's still not going to touch the surface. And he's got a television program he, which he comes on, talks about stigma and discrimination on television live. So it's the energy. He's young. He is. Uh, he said technology has to play a huge role, and he also is do media medicine, which is part of the digital mental health environment anyway. So, so he's talking about media medicine, and so, so he that energy was so palpable, John, that I have undertaken to go there for three days and uh, next month. So I'm going there for three days. I'm the guest of the government of uh, Bangladesh. So it's no more just a developed nation. Every nation, uh, Nigeria is working with us. Middle East is working with us. So what does a good look like? It's a global conversation and. Uh, I feel some of those countries are going to leapfrog. They're not going to have a linear development from A to B to C. They will probably go to A to C direct. Yeah. And do you think from that leapfrogging then, say, we in the U.S. could learn from those countries, actually, and that may be where progress comes from? Yes, I think learning is a beautiful thing. You know, uh, I learned from the uh, state of Oklahoma. They've got an amazing uh, program for first responders. Uh, the police cars carry this uh, I, um, iPad. And if they're attending to a mental health event um, and, and how, how they are able to access, uh, how to handle that, um, you know, mental health event uh, uh, when they are attending to it. So, and there is a hotline on it and there's a, a clinician they can talk to and how they've been able to de-escalate uh, what would have otherwise become a kind of a, for a nasty situation. So, so I'm in the middle of uh, talking to three countries of EMIC member countries who are interested in bringing it from Oklahoma to their countries. That initiative, beautiful initiative, uh, well published, well researched. And likewise, there are so many things with Australia or Canada or um, and Sweden is doing better. So I think learning goes both ways. I don't think so. It's uh, one country can teach the rest of the countries. But uh, so what does that good look like? And uh, so sometimes I always, see, I always say, you know, so another saying which is, reminds me is sometimes unless we are looking at uh, how do we work uh, across borders, and but where is the mechanism? Fortunately, a lot of countries have found that um, working with uh, uh, EMIC, because we are not a commercial entity, we are a mental health charity. So it's easier to work with us. We have no vested interest in anything. So when I was uh, uh, presented as figure from 1919, uh, 19, uh, no, sorry, 2019, of young people's uh, completed uh, suicides in Australia, only 28% of those were known to the healthcare system. Only 28% of those were known. To, so the rest of the people did not even reach out to the help seeking. All right. So they are not known to the healthcare system. So the thing is, how do we provide services at a population mental health level, even to the people who are not reaching out to the traditional mental health support services? So I'm sure those numbers are different percentages in different countries, but we know we get the gist of that we need to develop whatever we develop for the entire population, not only for the people who are seeking help. So there is that, and, and also governments on their own, own alone cannot meet the total demand for mental health services. We need to have a community-based responses. You know, community needs to take, the scale of challenges in front of us is so big. So how, what does a good look like? And this is where recently we did a series of six roundtables, uh, Sydney in Australia, New South Wales, Melbourne in Victoria, Adelaide in um, uh, South Australia, and then three in New Zealand where the ministers were there, all the chief mental health commissioners, the Department of Health, everyone was there. 
But that grassroots level engagement is so pivotal to getting it right. It cannot be a conversation left only for the ivory towers in the capitals of those nations. If the community must take ownership of it. So, so you, there is a lot happening, which probably does not get recognized and appreciated. But I get to see a lot of good work. And the, uh, the young, um, it's not a remit of only the young uh, mental health clinicians. I've seen the psychiatrists of all age brackets, to be honest, equally excited like a like a little kid in a lolly shop you know they are wanting to absorb it so they are leadership we talk about leadership development but how do we spawn this leadership how do we help them you know uh, become the good leaders and the mentors for the rest of the sector and related to that i think we'll open up the questions we'll go for a couple of minutes I, I think about thinking about kind of how to reach and you know, like you just the people that come to formal care is a very small percentage. I think that's done in... So, so Stephen from the UK is asking, how do you think about the opportunity of generative AI, the chat GPTs, the large language models in this space? Is this yet another technology or are you seeing something here that's truly different than say apps and VR and all the things that have come before? I think... Uh... It was very different when I started uh, digital mental health uh, journey 26 years ago. It's evolved and uh, and it's come to where it is today, generative AI. and uh, uh, So all of that is uh, playing a huge role. And in 20 years from now on, it'll be another set of a subset of uh, um, uh, other developments. So we see that as part of the continuous development life cycles of the domain, uh, the technology modes and communication. Uh, we need to exercise a degree of caution, of course, but it's here to stay. And we also know how some amazing organizations, there was a kids help phone from Canada recently on a tour with me to Australia and New Zealand and how they're using AI. Uh, they're the largest provider of digital mental health solutions. They are using AI for all Canadians. Uh, young people, all Canadian young people. So what does a good look like? So, you know, and and uh, how they're managing the clinical risk and everything else. It's, so there is a good examples of uh, what's working and how, but, and how do we work and collaborate with them? That's another thing. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it feels like every couple months there's a new version of these chatbots <laughs> too. <laughs> you, you learn one and the next one comes out, but I do think the principles you talked about of, does it work for patients? Does it work for workflow? Are there standards around? I think your the principles that you have for EMIC do provide a nice way to at least think about what could be useful and what could work well in it. A related question is, I think all of us perhaps have seen different ways policy could happen or that we could reimburse or we could regulate technologies how do people go about implementing policy change? I realize it's different, but have you seen it's effective to kind of meet with leaders? Is it that you publish high impact papers? Is it that you work together with people with experience and share stories? How do you kind of, how do individuals begin to make those policy changes to kind of make a more fertile landscape for digital mental health? Yeah, it's a fairly loaded question, John, but... Uh... <laughs> Uh, it reminds me of one statement uh, who uh, I'm, I'm sure you know him well, and I'm, I hold him in extremely high regard and respect. His name is Dr. Shekhar Saxena. Uh, he used to be the former um, head of mental health for WHO. And when he was at WHO in Geneva, he coined the term, when it comes to mental health, all countries are developing countries. And I think it's so beautiful, so appropriate, not even a single country that I work with can put hand on their heart that we've got it right. So I think, so So when it comes to mental health and within that, there is a hidden um, uh, sort of a pain and that is, it does not get the same level of fiscal investment uh, to get it right, you know? So we know the problem, but uh, it's always the poor cousin and it's not got the same high level status as other, uh, you know, mm -hmm. long-term conditions. So, so we have, we are constrained by the resources. So because the nature of EMIC is we work with the governments of those nations, or sometimes in some cases, like in uh, Australia, we'll be working with the state government and not just the federal, or in Canada, we'll be working with provinces and uh, same in the United States. So we would work with state and federal both. So I think it depends on which country we are, we call them different things. So, um, 
the policy implementation is, uh, first of all, I always say, uh, you can get it right by design, so which is either you can work uh, top down, so uh, get it right at the, what I would call as the commissioning levels at the ministry uh, where uh, decisions are being made, or you can work ground up. And so we, nature of organization lent for us to work top down, working with the uh, nations, because we, we um, that's where the highest impact, but it's probably also, it's not that easy either. It probably sounds a lot easier. It's not, it's because governments change and, and, and people change. So it seems like every couple of years in the same country, we're having a starting a, a new conversation sometimes. So, so, um, so I think, uh, but you, I, I yet have to meet a, a person anywhere in the world who is uh, evil in the thoughts or, uh, or the intentions. They all want the best for the nation. They all want the best for the people of their nation. So, so they are working within the constraints of the environment where they are working. So I, I think it's very important to have that innate respect for those uh, institutions. They are wanting to address the issue. So we have become, we want to become part of the solution as opposed to keep sort of uh, saying you are ineffective or you're not uh, addressing the problem. So, um, so part of that is working with those governments. And so what we do is through the process of osmosis, uh, we have uh, training programs where uh, one country is able to pair up with the other country and how they got this right. So Australia is a great example of Quality and Care Commission of Australia is doing a beautiful and uh, impressive work in implementing digital mental standards across Australia. What? Why can't we partner with them? Why can't they be part of the brag and steal uh, notion I was talking okay. about? You know, so the, so there is a lot to learn through the process of osmosis by working together. That makes sense. And for one final question, I think this is a an interesting one from Violet. She says, "What are your thoughts on creating training for machine learning engineers who train AI with basic outlines of what is mental health, what professionals want, what patients want, right? So we have all these AI, all these very smart engineers doing really good work, but they may not have much mental health experience or understand the field. Could we train them? Could we help those engineers learn? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you, you're asking a beautiful question. Uh, and, and that to be honest, uh, it's always been a bugbear because the people who are developing and coding these solutions have got nothing to do with mental health. You know, generally they are outside the domain and, um, and they are getting a remit and uh, probably guidance from some clinical team somewhere within those organizations. I hope so. Uh, but, uh, but I think uh, the key thing is um, they could, could there be a training? Absolutely. Yes. What does it look like? I do not know. So we, because the, the lack of workforce development or training for, uh, forget about for uh, the non-clinicians like the coding people, but even for the clinician, there's, there, there isn't enough, there isn't much. So AMIC made a very humble investment in some sort of uh, digital mental health academy type development, which we are uh, uh, trialing with the government of Singapore right now. So I think there are some humble initiatives. It's uh, it's uh, it's through the partnership and I am, uh, I invite uh, if you are interested to reach out to me um, um, by writing to uh, JMIR and uh, they can pass on my contact details to you. Uh, but I think it's important for us to work together, become part of this movement. And, uh, and I think we can, we can uh, make that training uh, easily um, uh, you know, first of all, developed for fit for purpose. Uh, as I talked about lived experience, in that case, uh, the person, uh, we need to hear what their needs are and uh, the people are coding, the people who are going to be recipient of the training. Come and participate at this year's Congress. You will meet people like you <laughs> there, people who will excite you, people you will form lifelong collaboration. The mental health or digital mental health is not a one-off event. It's not something which we can just... Uh, say this is the answer. This is a needs to be a lifelong commitment. And I always say mental health, digital mental health has no geopolitical boundaries. You know, it's a one world, one family, one future. Yeah. I think that's a wonderful place to start on. And I certainly, I will be at the meeting too. So I'll see you in person. It's, as we said, it's nice to do virtual meetings. So I think 
hopefully we'll be able to meet some of you in the audience or some of you watching asynchronously at the Digital Mental Health International Congress in September. But Neil, thank you so much for sharing with people what EMIC is, what you do, how you do it, what's working well, what we need to improve on, how people can get involved. Those are some some tricky questions too in there. Those weren't all easy ones. So thank you for being so honest and just sharing your passion and enthusiasm. I think it's inspiring just to think about this at our larger level than people's kind of paper or their project or their small team. And when you the way you present it, you go, this is a big challenge, but we do have a big team if we work together. And I think that's what makes what you've done of eMix so wonderful. It gives you new hope and new ways to look at it and go, oh my gosh, I have to figure this all out on my phone alone. It's There's a team and you're organizing it. So thank you for joining us. Thank you everyone for listening live. And for those of you tuning in afterwards, we hope to meet some of you in person. Bye. Thank you.